Not every car from the past was a masterpiece, especially for those on a tight budget. For many, affordability meant choosing between some of the most awkward, clunky, and downright ugly cars ever produced. These vehicles weren't just cheap, they were an eyesore on wheels. With strange proportions, bizarre design choices, and uninspired aesthetics, they became notorious for their looks. These were the cars you'd buy out of necessity, not desire. Ready to discover the 12 ugliest cars that only those strapped for cash could afford? Get ready for a parade of questionable designs. <laughs> Fiat 126, produced from 1972 to 2000, occupies a unique place in automotive history as a compact city car that aimed to provide affordable mobility during a time of economic change in Europe. While it enjoyed a long production run, its fundamental flaws, particularly its basic design and underwhelming performance, ultimately contributed to its perception as a failure in the eyes of many consumers and critics alike. At its launch, the Fiat 126 was intended to succeed the iconic Fiat 500, which had gained immense popularity as a practical and economical vehicle. However, despite the lineage, the 126 lacked the charm and character that made its predecessor a beloved symbol of post-war Italy. Its design was starkly utilitarian, characterized by boxy lines and a simplistic, angular profile that felt outdated even at the time of its introduction. The aesthetic appeal of the Fiat 126 was minimal, with a front fascia that featured basic round headlights and a small grill. This no-frills approach to design, while in line with the car's purpose as a budget-friendly option, resulted in a vehicle that struggled to excite buyers looking for a more appealing automotive experience. Under the skin, the Fiat 126 was powered by a modest two-cylinder, air-cooled engine, producing a mere 23 horsepower. This engine configuration, while economical, left much to be desired in terms of performance. The car's lack of power made acceleration sluggish, and it often struggled to keep pace with traffic, particularly on highways or steep inclines. As urbanization increased and the demand for more capable city cars grew, the 126's underpowered engine became a significant drawback. Drivers often found the performance inadequate for their needs, and the limited speed and agility made it a less attractive option compared to competitors that offered more power and better handling. The Fiat 126's interior was equally basic, designed to maximize space and affordability rather than comfort or luxury. The cabin featured minimalistic instrumentation and simple seating, which while practical, lacked the refinement or modern touches that consumers increasingly desired. While the compact dimensions of the 126 made it well-suited for city driving, easily maneuverable in tight spaces and able to navigate congested streets, the overall experience was somewhat spartan, leaving many drivers longing for more in terms of comfort and amenities. Moreover, the Fiat 126 faced significant reliability issues throughout its production life. Owners often reported problems with electrical systems, rust, and other mechanical failures which tarnished its reputation for durability. In a time when consumers were beginning to prioritize reliability alongside affordability, the 126's frequent breakdowns and maintenance concerns alienated potential buyers who were looking for a dependable vehicle. The perception of the Fiat brand also suffered as the 126's issues contributed to a broader narrative about the quality of Italian automotive manufacturing during this period. Despite these shortcomings, the Fiat 126 did achieve a measure of success in certain markets, particularly in Poland, where it was produced under license and became known as the Maluk, meaning little one. In Poland, the Fiat 126 became a cultural icon, symbolizing mobility for the masses during a time of economic hardship. The car's affordability and compact size made it a popular choice among urban dwellers and it served as an essential means of transportation for many families. This local adaptation helped bolster the Fiat 126's reputation in Eastern Europe, even as its global image suffered. As the automotive industry evolved throughout the 1980s and 1990s, the Fiat 126 struggled to keep up with changing consumer demands. The rise of more advanced, efficient, and stylish small cars meant that the 126's basic design and underpowered performance 
became increasingly out of touch with market expectations. By the time production ceased in 2000, the automotive landscape had shifted dramatically, leaving the Fiat 126 feeling like a relic of a bygone era. In retrospect, the Fiat 126 serves as a case study in the challenges of balancing affordability, performance, and design in the automotive industry. While it managed to fulfill its original purpose as a compact city car, the AMC Matador, manufactured between 1971 and 1978, represents a significant chapter in the history of American automotive manufacturing, one marked by ambition, but ultimately marred by missteps. Designed to cater to the mid-sized car market, the Matador aimed to capture the spirit of American innovation and style. However, it quickly became emblematic of the struggles faced by the American Motors Corporation, AMC, in a highly competitive landscape. A combination of unattractive design, inefficient performance, and a lack of refinement contributed to its failure to resonate with consumers, particularly during a time of economic uncertainty. When the Matador was introduced in 1971, it was intended to fill the void left by the outgoing AMC Ambassador and compete against the likes of the Ford Torino and Chevrolet Malibu. The Matador was available in various body styles, including a two-door coupe, four-door sedan, and even a station wagon, providing options for different consumer needs. However, from the outset, it faced criticism for its design, especially regarding the coupe variant which many observers considered unattractive and awkward. The coupe's bulky lines and awkward proportions led to widespread derision, with some critics likening its design to a land yacht rather than a sleek automobile. The front end, featuring an oversized grille and rectangular headlights, further detracted from its appeal, creating a visual disconnect that failed to attract buyers. As automotive design evolved throughout the 1970s, the Matador's styling appeared increasingly outdated. The era was marked by a move towards sleeker, more aerodynamic forms that emphasized fuel efficiency and modernity. In contrast, the Matador seemed to represent an old-school approach to design, complete with heavy bodywork and a conservative silhouette that lacked the excitement that consumers were beginning to expect. Compounding these issues, the lack of vibrant color options and dynamic design features made the Matador blend into the background among its more visually appealing competitors. The Matador's performance was another significant area of concern. Initially, it was equipped with a range of engine options, including a base six-cylinder engine and larger V8 configurations. However, the fuel crisis of the early 1970s dramatically shifted consumer priorities toward fuel efficiency. While AMC attempted to address this by offering smaller engine options, the Matador's inherent size and weight rendered it less economical than many smaller vehicles that were gaining popularity. With rising fuel prices, buyers were increasingly looking for vehicles that could deliver better miles per gallon, and the Matador's relatively poor fuel economy became a major liability. The performance of the Matador also suffered from its suspension and handling characteristics which were often criticized as being less responsive compared to rivals. While it offered a comfortable ride for everyday use, its handling dynamics failed to inspire confidence. As more nimble and efficient cars entered the market, many consumers opted for vehicles that provided a sportier driving experience, further sidelining the Matador. In an era where drivers were beginning to prioritize performance as much as practicality, the Matador's lack of agility and driving enjoyment became glaring shortcomings. Additionally, the Matador's interior, while spacious, fell short of the standards set by competitors. Critics noted that the quality of materials used in the cabin felt cheap and uninviting, lacking the refinement and sophistication expected in mid-size family cars. Features such as vinyl upholstery and simplistic dashboard layouts did little to elevate the driving experience. Many consumers were transitioning to vehicles that offered more comfort and technological advancements, and the Matador's lack of modern features and amenities left it feeling outdated. As the Matador struggled in the marketplace, AMC found it increasingly difficult to compete with larger manufacturers that were investing heavily in innovation and marketing. The company lacked the financial resources to launch a significant advertising campaign to boost the Matador's profile, which further hampered its visibility. With competitors like Ford and Chevrolet introducing new models that boasted both style and performance, the Matador faded into obscurity. 
Despite AMC's efforts to revamp the Matador with facelifts and updates over its production run, these attempts did little to revive consumer interest or sales figures. By the late 1970s, the Matador was no longer a viable contender in the midsize market. The combination of unattractive design, performance inefficiencies, and a lack of refinement led to its eventual decline. As consumers sought alternatives that offered better fuel efficiency in modern styling, the Matador's sales dwindled. The Chrysler Simca 1307, produced from 1975 to 1986, represents a fascinating chapter in the automotive industry, marked by initial acclaim followed by significant disappointment. When it debuted, it garnered considerable attention, even winning the European Car of the Year Award in 1976. This accolade, typically a harbinger of success, quickly faded as the model's reputation soured, primarily due to rust issues, inconsistent build quality, and an increasingly outdated design that failed to appeal to consumers over time. Designed as a family-oriented hatchback, the Simca 1 307 aimed to capture the growing market for practical yet stylish vehicles in Europe. With its fastback silhouette, spacious interior, and practical hatchback configuration, it sought to balance functionality and aesthetics. The car featured a roomy cabin that could comfortably accommodate passengers while also offering ample cargo space making it an attractive choice for families and individuals alike. Upon its release, the Simca 1307 was generally well-received. Early reviews highlighted its innovative design and practicality, praising its ability to offer a versatile solution for daily transportation needs. However, beneath the surface, significant flaws began to surface that would ultimately tarnish its reputation. One of the most critical issues was the car's susceptibility to rust, Many owners found themselves facing significant rust problems within just a few years of ownership. This was particularly concerning in regions where road salt and moisture were prevalent, as these factors exacerbated the rusting process. Despite the vehicle's marketing as a durable family car, the reality was that it often fell short of expectations, leading to frustration among owners. While competitors were increasingly investing in advanced rust-proofing technologies and protective coatings, the Simca 1307 seemed to lag behind in this regard, contributing to a growing perception of the vehicle as unreliable. In addition to rust issues, the build quality of the Simca 1307 was inconsistent. While some owners experienced relatively trouble-free journeys, others faced a myriad of mechanical and electrical failures that detracted from the overall driving experience. This inconsistency in quality was a major factor in the model's decline as negative word of mouth regarding reliability began to circulate, influencing potential buyers' perceptions. The design of the Simca 1307, which was once praised, also faced scrutiny as the years progressed. As the automotive landscape evolved, some observers found its styling awkward, particularly the rear end, which lacked the visual appeal of competing models. The car began to look dated compared to newer vehicles that offered sleeker lines and more modern designs. As the hatchback segment gained popularity, the Simca 1307 struggled to compete with rivals that embraced contemporary aesthetics and functionality. Despite its initial promise and accolades, the Simca 1307 faced mounting challenges in a competitive marketplace. As its reputation for rust and unreliability grew, so did competition from other manufacturers that provided more appealing and dependable options. In an era when consumers were starting to prioritize reliability and modern design, the shortcomings of the Simca 1307 became increasingly pronounced, leading to declining sales and interest. Ultimately, the Chrysler Simca 1307 serves as a cautionary tale in automotive history. Its journey from celebrated model to an example of missed potential illustrates how initial success can quickly be overshadowed by persistent flaws. While it aimed to provide a practical and stylish solution for families, the vehicle's rust issues, inconsistent build quality, and awkward design led to a tarnished reputation that overshadowed its early accolades. Today, the Simca 1307 is often remembered as a reflection of the challenges faced by automakers in adapting to changing consumer preferences and the critical importance of quality in building a lasting brand. The Hillman Hunter, produced from 1966 to 1979, 
is often remembered as a car that, despite its initial promise, ultimately fell short in a rapidly evolving automotive landscape. Designed as a family sedan, the Hunter aimed to provide a practical and economical option for consumers seeking reliable transportation. However, a combination of uninspiring design, lackluster performance, and outdated technology contributed to its decline and eventual failure in a market increasingly dominated by competitors who offered more appealing and innovative vehicles. At its inception, the Hillman Hunter was intended to appeal to budget-conscious families who needed a reliable car without breaking the bank. With its straightforward design and functional interior, it offered decent space for passengers and cargo, making it a sensible choice for those looking for a practical vehicle. The price point was attractive, but while the Hunter was economically viable, it quickly gained a reputation for being simply cheap. Its exterior was characterized by a boxy shape and unremarkable lines, reflecting a design ethos that prioritized utility over aesthetics. In an era where style began to play a significant role in consumer choices, the Hillman Hunter's bland appearance failed to resonate with potential buyers who were increasingly attracted to more stylish and contemporary designs. Performance was another area where the Hillman Hunter struggled. Equipped with modest engines that delivered adequate but uninspiring power, the car provided a driving experience that was far from exhilarating. The available engines, though reliable, were largely unremarkable, lacking the spirited performance that drivers sought. As competition in the family car segment intensified, the Hunter's sluggish acceleration and lack of responsiveness became glaring weaknesses. In contrast, rivals like the Ford Cortina began to dominate the market, offering a more engaging driving experience and superior handling characteristics. The Cortina's advancements in performance, particularly in terms of suspension and powertrain technology, positioned it as a leader in its class, further highlighting the Hunter's shortcomings. The automotive landscape of the late 1960s and early 1970s was one of rapid change and evolution. Consumers began to prioritize not just reliability, but also innovation, comfort, and driving pleasure. The Hillman Hunter, however, appeared static, unable to adapt to these shifting consumer expectations. While competitors were introducing cutting-edge features, such as improved safety measures, fuel efficiency, and advanced suspension systems, the Hunter remained anchored in its outdated platform. This stagnation left it feeling increasingly irrelevant as the market embraced more modern designs and technologies. The lack of innovation extended beyond performance and design. It also impacted the Hillman Hunter's marketing appeal. In an era when competitors actively promoted their latest features and technologies, the Hunter's marketing strategy often felt inadequate. Buyers were drawn to brands that demonstrated a commitment to progress and modernity, while the Hunter seemed to represent a bygone era that lacked the excitement and innovation that consumers craved. This disconnect contributed to a decline in interest in sales as potential buyers gravitated towards more compelling options. Moreover, the Hillman Hunter was produced during a period of significant upheaval in the automotive industry, marked by economic challenges, changing regulations, and rising fuel costs. The late 1970s brought about a growing awareness of environmental issues and fuel efficiency, leading consumers to favor vehicles that offered better mileage and more sustainable options. The Hunter's reputation as a cheap and practical choice could not outweigh the growing emphasis on performance and environmental considerations. As fuel prices surged during the oil crisis, buyers began to reconsider their vehicle choices, gravitating towards smaller, more efficient cars. The Hillman Hunter's larger size and less favorable fuel consumption made it less appealing in this changing landscape. In response to these challenges, the Hunter's manufacturer, Chrysler UK, attempted to address some of the criticisms by introducing updates and revisions. However, these efforts often came too late as the competition had already moved ahead with more comprehensive improvements. The Hunter's updates failed to resonate with consumers who were already looking elsewhere for their next vehicle purchase. By the time production of the Hillman Hunter ceased in 1979, it had become evident that the car was unable to compete effectively in a market that had become increasingly diverse and competitive. The rise of Japanese automakers and their focus on quality and reliability further compounded the challenges faced by the Hunter. 
The Dodge Aspen, produced from 1976 to 1980, was part of Chrysler's efforts to capitalize on the growing demand for compact cars in the wake of the oil crisis. Marketed as an affordable family vehicle, the Aspen aimed to combine practicality with a touch of style. However, despite its initial promise, the Aspen quickly became synonymous with a host of problems that ultimately led to its failure in the competitive automotive landscape of the late 1970s. One of the most significant factors contributing to the Aspen's downfall was its notorious reputation for rust in structural issues. These problems became apparent early in its production run, leading to numerous recalls that tarnished the model's reputation. Buyers who expected a reliable and durable vehicle were instead confronted with complaints about rust forming on critical areas of the car, including the undercarriage and wheel wells. These issues not only affected the car's appearance, but also raised serious safety concerns as rust could compromise the structural integrity of the vehicle. This frequent rusting problem alienated potential buyers who were looking for a dependable vehicle that could withstand the test of time. The frequent recalls associated with the Aspen did significant damage to its reputation in the marketplace. In an era where consumer trust was paramount, the persistent issues led to a loss of confidence in the brand. Many consumers began to associate Dodge with poor quality and unreliable vehicles, and this perception was difficult to shake. The bad press generated by these recalls further compounded the vehicle's struggles, making it challenging for Dodge to win back customers who were disillusioned by the constant issues surrounding the Aspen. In addition to rust problems, the Aspen was plagued by reliability issues that contributed to its negative reputation. Many owners reported frequent breakdowns and mechanical failures, which not only frustrated drivers, but also resulted in increased repair costs. The combination of structural issues and mechanical failures painted a picture of a poorly constructed vehicle that failed to live up to its marketing promises. This perception was detrimental to sales, especially as consumers began to favor brands that were known for their reliability and quality. The lack of confidence in the Aspen made it difficult for Dodge to compete against rivals that were producing vehicles known for their dependability. The Dodge Aspen was also overshadowed by its competitors, which were offering more appealing alternatives in the compact car market. During the late 1970s, automakers like Toyota and Honda were gaining traction in the United States with their reliable, fuel-efficient models. The Aspen, while marketed as an affordable compact car, did not offer the same level of fuel efficiency or modern design that consumers were starting to seek. As the market shifted towards smaller, more economical vehicles, the Aspen's larger size and less efficient engines became a disadvantage. Potential buyers were drawn to competitors that promised not only reliability, but also innovative features and better fuel economy. The marketing strategy for the Dodge Aspen further complicated its position in the market. While it was promoted as a budget-friendly family vehicle, the Aspen lacked distinctive features that would set it apart from other compact cars. The design was relatively bland, failing to capture the excitement of its competitors. Consumers were increasingly looking for vehicles that not only met their practical needs, but also offered a sense of style and personality. The Aspen's uninspired aesthetics made it difficult for Dodge to generate enthusiasm among potential buyers who might have otherwise considered the vehicle as a viable option. Despite its initial promise and potential, the Dodge Aspen ultimately fell victim to a combination of quality issues, reliability problems, and a failure to stand out in an increasingly competitive market. The structural issues and rust problems became emblematic of the broader challenges facing Chrysler during this period, as the company struggled to maintain its market position against rising competition from foreign automakers. As production of the Aspen came to an end in 1980, it became clear that the vehicle had failed to resonate with consumers in a significant way. The model's legacy is one of caution, reminding manufacturers of the critical importance of quality control, reliability, and design in a highly competitive industry. The Aspen serves as an example of how a promising concept can falter when execution falls short, illustrating the delicate balance that automakers must strike between affordability and quality. Today, the Dodge Aspen is often remembered not just for its shortcomings, 
but as a case study in the pitfalls of neglecting consumer expectations in an ever-evolving market. The Renault 10, produced from 1965 to 1971, aimed to build on the success of its predecessor, the Renault 8, by offering a compact, affordable family car with a rear engine layout. However, despite its ambitions, the Renault 10 encountered significant challenges that hindered its success in the competitive automotive market of the late 1960s and early 1970s. At the core of the Renault 10's struggles was its rear engine configuration. While this design provided a spacious cabin and a flat floor, it also created handling difficulties that many drivers found challenging. The placement of the engine at the rear resulted in a weight distribution that made the car feel unbalanced, especially during tight turns or emergency maneuvers. The driving dynamics of rear engine cars can be tricky, and in the case of the Renault 10, the awkward handling did not inspire confidence among drivers. This aspect of its performance made it less appealing to consumers who valued a reliable and predictable driving experience. Aesthetically, the Renault 10 suffered from an outdated design. Its boxy shape and bulbous proportions appeared antiquated even at launch, especially compared to more contemporary models like the Fiat 124 and Ford Cortina, which boasted sleek lines and attractive styling elements. The Renault 10's lack of charisma and visual appeal made it difficult to attract buyers who were increasingly looking for cars that made a statement. The bland front grille and lack of distinctive design features contributed to a sense of mediocrity, positioning the car as less desirable in the eyes of potential customers. In terms of performance, the Renault 10 did not meet expectations. Although equipped with an adequate engine for city driving, it struggled to deliver the power necessary for highway driving or acceleration when needed. The engine's performance was generally considered underwhelming, leading to sluggish acceleration and difficulty during overtaking maneuvers. This lack of power became especially significant during the oil crisis of the early 1970s, when consumers began prioritizing fuel efficiency without sacrificing performance. The Renault 10's underpowered engine failed to resonate with buyers seeking a balance of efficiency and driving enjoyment. Reliability issues further tarnished the Renault 10's reputation. Owners frequently reported problems with various components, including electrical systems and engine reliability. As consumers increasingly prioritized long-term durability in their vehicles, the Renault 10's propensity for breakdowns became a major barrier to its success. Word of mouth about the car's unreliability spread, leading potential buyers to seek out competitors known for their dependability. The Renault 10's struggles with mechanical issues reinforced a perception that it was not a wise investment for those seeking a dependable vehicle. The marketing strategy for the Renault 10 also played a role in its lack of success. Positioned as an affordable family car, it targeted budget-conscious consumers. However, as the automotive market evolved, consumer preferences shifted toward vehicles that offered more than just basic transportation. Many buyers began seeking cars with enhanced features, comfort, and modernity. The Renault 10's failure to differentiate itself in an increasingly crowded market hindered its sales as competitors provided more attractive options. Socioeconomic factors during the late 1960s and early 1970s further complicated the Renault 10's market position. The oil crisis of 1973 significantly altered consumer behavior, prompting drivers to prioritize fuel efficiency in response to rising gas prices. Unfortunately, the Renault 10's fuel economy, combined with its lack of performance, made it less appealing during this period of economic uncertainty. As automakers scrambled to meet consumer demands for efficient vehicles, the Renault 10 struggled to adapt to the rapidly changing landscape. In summary, the Renault 10 exemplifies how even well-intentioned designs can falter due to critical issues related to handling, performance, and aesthetics. Despite its initial promise, the Renault 10's handling challenges, reliability issues, and outdated design ultimately led to its decline in popularity. The car's production ceased in 1971, marking the end of a model that failed to capture the market's imagination. The story of the Renault 10 serves as a reminder of the importance of aligning design choices with consumer expectations. As the automotive industry continues to evolve, the lessons learned from the Renault 10's struggles remain relevant, underscoring the need for manufacturers to deliver vehicles that combine functionality, performance, 
and visual appeal. While the Renault 10 may have faded into obscurity, its legacy lives on as a reflection of the challenges faced by many vehicles during a transformative period in automotive history. The Sunbeam Alpine, produced from 1959 to 1968, was a British sports car that aimed to capture the hearts of enthusiasts with its stylish design and open-top driving experience. Despite its attractive aesthetics and initial appeal, the Alpine ultimately struggled to establish itself as a formidable contender in the sports car market. Several factors contributed to its failure to gain lasting popularity, particularly its underwhelming performance, build quality issues, and the evolving landscape of the automotive industry. At first glance, the Sunbeam Alpine presented a captivating design that attracted attention on the road. With its sleek lines, rounded body, and sporty silhouette, it embodied the essence of a classic British roadster. The appeal of open-top motoring was an integral part of its marketing, promising drivers a sense of freedom and adventure. However, while the exterior was undeniably stylish, it quickly became apparent that the Alpine's performance did not match its appearance. One of the critical shortcomings of the Sunbeam Alpine was its powertrain. The car was equipped with a four-cylinder engine that, while adequate for casual driving, was significantly underpowered compared to its contemporaries, such as the Triumph TR4 and MGB. Enthusiasts seeking the thrill of spirited driving found the Alpine lacking in acceleration and speed, which diminished its appeal as a sports car. The lack of performance led many potential buyers to opt for competitors that offered a more exhilarating driving experience. The mismatch between style and substance became a defining characteristic of the Alpine's reputation. In addition to its performance issues, the Sunbeam Alpine was plagued by concerns regarding build quality. While the car's design was appealing, Many owners reported frequent mechanical problems, ranging from minor issues to more severe breakdowns. The reliability of the Alpine became a significant concern among drivers, leading to frustration and dissatisfaction. Poor quality control and inconsistent assembly processes contributed to the car's reputation as a vehicle that required frequent maintenance and repairs, further distancing it from the expectations of sports car enthusiasts who prioritize reliability alongside performance. The Alpine's struggles were exacerbated by the rapidly changing automotive landscape of the 1960s. As consumer preferences shifted, sports cars began to evolve in terms of performance, technology, and design. The emergence of more powerful and reliable competitors, including models from Japanese manufacturers like Datsun and Toyota, further intensified the competition. These newer vehicles offered a combination of sporty aesthetics and reliable performance making it challenging for the Alpine to retain its relevance in a crowded market. The allure of the classic British Roadster began to wane as consumers sought more modern options that aligned with their desires for performance and dependability. Marketing strategies also played a role in the Sunbeam Alpine's challenges. Despite its attractive design and the allure of open-top motoring, the Alpine's branding struggled to differentiate itself effectively from the competition. The messaging surrounding the car failed to resonate with potential buyers who were increasingly drawn to vehicles that showcase cutting-edge technology and enhanced driving experiences. In a time when automotive innovation was becoming a priority, the Alpine's relatively simple engineering and lack of advanced features left it feeling outdated. In 1968, after nearly a decade of production, the Sunbeam Alpine was discontinued marking the end of a model that struggled to find its place in a rapidly evolving automotive market. While it retains a certain nostalgic charm among enthusiasts today, the Alpine's legacy is one of missed opportunities and unfulfilled potential. The car is often remembered as a stylish but underperforming sports car that could not compete with its more capable rivals. The story of the Sunbeam Alpine serves as a reminder of the importance of aligning performance with design and the necessity for manufacturers to adapt to changing consumer preferences. As the automotive industry continues to evolve, the lessons learned from the Alpine's shortcomings remain relevant, highlighting the need for balance between style and substance in the pursuit of automotive excellence. Despite its shortcomings, the Alpine remains a symbol of an era when British sports cars captured the imagination of drivers, embodying the spirit of adventure and freedom that continues to resonate with car enthusiasts today. 
The Vauxhall Viva HA, produced from 1963 to 1966, was a compact car that entered the automotive market at a time when consumer preferences were shifting dramatically. This era saw a growing demand for affordable and practical vehicles that could meet the needs of families and individuals alike. Despite its intentions to provide a reliable, economical solution for everyday transportation, the Viva HA struggled significantly to leave a lasting positive impression on both consumers and critics. Its shortcomings in build quality, mechanical reliability, and design led to its classification as an underwhelming choice in a competitive automotive landscape. Upon its introduction, the Vauxhall Viva HA was marketed as a compact and budget-friendly car, targeting the growing segment of the market that sought simplicity and functionality over flashy designs and high-performance capabilities. With its modest dimensions and straightforward design, the Viva HA was particularly appealing to urban dwellers who needed a practical vehicle for navigating busy streets and tight parking spaces. Its layout emphasized efficiency and ease of use, traits that were increasingly valued during the early 1960s. However, despite these advantages, the Viva HA quickly became synonymous with quality issues, a reputation that would haunt it throughout its production run. One of the most pressing problems was its pronounced vulnerability to rust. Owners often reported significant corrosion issues, particularly around critical areas such as the wheel arches, sills, and undercarriage. This vulnerability stemmed from inadequate protective coatings and insufficient attention to anti-corrosion measures during the manufacturing process. As a result, many vehicles suffered from premature deterioration, leading to costly repairs and diminishing resale values. The rust issues not only undermined consumer confidence, but also tarnished Vauxhall's brand reputation, positioning the Viva HA as an untrustworthy option in a market that increasingly emphasized durability and long-term reliability. Mechanical reliability further compounded the Viva HA's challenges. Many owners faced a litany of mechanical problems that ranged from minor inconveniences to significant failures. Common issues included electrical faults, engine performance inconsistencies, and difficulties with the transmission. This lack of reliability was particularly disheartening for customers who had invested their hard-earned money in what they hoped would be a dependable family car. The frequent mechanical issues, coupled with the rust problems, resulted in a perception that the Viva HA was more of a liability than a valuable asset, discouraging potential buyers who sought peace of mind in their automotive choices. The competitive landscape in which the Viva HA found itself was also a critical factor in its failure to gain traction. During the 1960s, a myriad of compact cars flooded the market, offering a diverse range of features, styles, and levels of performance. Models such as the Ford Cortina and the Morris 1100 quickly emerged as favorites among consumers, providing a combination of innovative design, superior build quality, and mechanical reliability that the Viva HA could not match. As these competitors continued to capture market share, the Viva HA's bland styling and uninspired performance made it an increasingly unattractive option for buyers seeking a more engaging driving experience. In terms of design, the Viva HA's appearance lacked the flair and sophistication that began to characterize the new generation of compact cars. With its boxy shape, simplistic lines, and uninspired front grille, the Viva HA blended into the background rather than standing out on the road. This lack of visual appeal made it difficult for Vauxhall to market the vehicle effectively as consumers were beginning to favor cars that were not only functional, but also stylish. In a market where aesthetics began to play a significant role in purchasing decisions, the Viva HA's drab design failed to inspire enthusiasm further isolating it from potential buyers. Vauxhall's marketing strategies also fell short of expectations. Although the company aimed to position the Viva HA as an economical family vehicle, the messaging failed to resonate with a diverse audience. As consumers increasingly gravitated toward vehicles that combined practicality with style, Vauxhall's focus on affordability and simplicity proved inadequate. The failure to convey a compelling narrative around the Viva HA limited its appeal, allowing competitors to dominate the conversation around desirable compact cars. As production of the Viva HA drew to a close in 1966, 
It became clear that the model had not met the expectations of either Vauxhall or its customers. In response to the myriad of challenges presented by the Viva HA, Vauxhall sought to redefine its compact car offering. The Skoda 1000 One UMB, produced between 1964 and 1969, represents a unique chapter in automotive history. It was a compact car developed in Czechoslovakia during a period when the country was striving to modernize its automotive offerings. Although the 1000 megabyte was marketed as an affordable option for consumers, it quickly gained a reputation for various mechanical issues that severely undermined its appeal. Its design, while innovative for the time, did not translate into a competitive edge, and it struggled to capture the attention of buyers amidst a growing influx of Western competitors. At its core, the Škoda 1000 MB featured a rear engine layout, which was intended to provide a space-efficient design and improved interior room. However, this configuration had significant drawbacks that became apparent as the car was put through everyday driving conditions. One of the most significant issues was the car's handling characteristics. The rear engine design often resulted in unpredictable behavior during cornering, leading to a sense of instability that could make driving the 1000 MB a challenging experience. For consumers who were accustomed to the more balanced handling of front engine vehicles, the 1000 MB's dynamics were a source of concern, ultimately detracting from its overall driving enjoyment. Moreover, the Škoda 1000 MB was plagued by mechanical issues, particularly concerning its cooling system. Reports of overheating were common, particularly in warmer weather or under heavy load, resulting in a high rate of engine failures. These mechanical shortcomings not only frustrated owners, but also cast a shadow over the car's reputation. The perception that the 1000 megabytes was unreliable contributed to its declining sales figures, as potential buyers opted for alternatives that offered better dependability and peace of mind. The cooling system issues were particularly damaging, as they not only posed risks to the vehicle's performance, but also required costly repairs that deterred many customers from committing to the model. Despite its affordability, the Škoda 1000 MB was ultimately overshadowed by its Western counterparts, which were increasingly dominating the market. Competitors like the Volkswagen Beetle and the Fiat 124 offered a combination of style, reliability, and build quality that the 1000 MB struggled to match. The sleek designs and advanced engineering of these Western models attracted consumers who were looking for vehicles that could not only meet their practical needs, but also offer a sense of prestige and modernity. The contrast between the Škoda 1000 MB and its competitors highlighted the disparities in design philosophy and manufacturing standards, making it increasingly difficult for the 1000 MB to carve out a niche in the competitive automotive landscape. The design of the Škoda 1000 MB, while innovative in its own right, did not resonate with consumers in the way that the company had hoped. Its boxy shape and utilitarian appearance lacked the flair and excitement that many buyers sought during the mid-1960s. As trends in automotive design shifted toward more aerodynamic and stylish vehicles, the 1000 MB's design quickly became outdated. This disconnect between consumer preferences and the vehicle's aesthetic appeal further contributed to its decline in popularity as buyers gravitated towards models that better reflected the contemporary tastes of the era. In light of these challenges, Škoda faced an uphill battle in marketing the 1000 megabytes. The company struggled to position the vehicle effectively within a crowded marketplace filled with enticing alternatives. Although the 1000 megabyte was priced competitively, the negative perceptions surrounding its reliability and performance limited its market potential. Potential buyers were reluctant to invest in a vehicle that was frequently associated with mechanical failures, no matter how affordable it might have been. The production of the Škoda 1000 M by the dust ultimately came to an end in 1969, marking a significant turning point for the company. Recognizing the shortcomings of the 1000 megabytes, Škoda sought to revamp its offerings and address the issues that had plagued its earlier models. The introduction of newer models in the subsequent years aimed to rectify the problems associated with the 1000 megabytes, focusing on enhancing reliability, improving design, 
in delivering a more satisfying driving experience for consumers. Reflecting on the legacy of the Skoda 1000 MB, it serves as a reminder of the critical importance of engineering excellence and consumer-centric design in the automotive industry. The lessons learned from its failures inform Skoda's development strategy moving forward, helping the company evolve and adapt to an ever-changing marketplace. While the 1000 megabytes may not have achieved the success its creators had envisioned, it played a crucial role in shaping Skoda's future direction. The Renault 4 CV, produced from 1947 to 1961, occupies a notable place in automotive history as one of France's first mass-produced cars after World War II. Designed to be an affordable, compact vehicle for the post-war market, the 4 CV was intended to provide mobility for a population in desperate need of reliable transportation. While it succeeded in offering an economical option, the car ultimately fell short in several critical areas that hindered its long-term success and appeal. One of the most significant drawbacks of the Renault 4 c was its performance. Equipped with a small, underpowered engine, the 4 c struggled to achieve satisfactory acceleration, making it one of the slowest cars on the road during its production run. With a modest 747 cubic centimeter engine, the car generated only about 20 horsepower, which meant that it took longer to reach cruising speeds compared to its competitors. For drivers accustomed to the performance capabilities of other compact cars, especially the Volkswagen Beetle, the 4 CV's sluggishness became a notable point of frustration. The limitations in power not only impacted the car's overall driving experience, but also made it less appealing for those seeking a vehicle capable of keeping pace with modern traffic conditions. In addition to its lack of power, the handling of the Renault 4 CV was less than ideal. The car's design featured a rear-mounted engine, which contributed to a distinctive weight distribution. While this setup allowed for more interior space and an efficient design, it also created handling challenges. The 4 CV's poor suspension and outdated chassis design led to a tendency for the car to feel unstable during cornering and maneuvers, resulting in a driving experience that was often described as uncomfortable and unresponsive. This lack of handling finesse was a significant drawback, especially for consumers who were becoming accustomed to the improved driving dynamics offered by competing vehicles. Despite its affordability, the Renault 4 CV struggled to compete with the Volkswagen Beetle, which had quickly established itself as a favorite among drivers across Europe and beyond. The Beetle's combination of reliability, solid performance, and iconic design resonated with consumers making it a cultural symbol of the era. In contrast, the 4 CV lacked the same level of popularity and its shortcomings became more apparent as consumers began to compare the two models. The Beetle's reputation for durability and low maintenance costs further underscored the 4 CV's inadequacies, leading many potential buyers to favor the more established and well-regarded option. Moreover, the 4 CV's design, while functional, did not capture the imagination of consumers in the same way as its more stylish competitors. Its boxy shape and utilitarian appearance were often criticized for being uninspiring and lacking character. In an era when automotive design was beginning to embrace more fluid lines and distinctive shapes, the 4 CV's design felt outdated and unremarkable. This visual blandness contributed to its failure to create an emotional connection with potential buyers who were increasingly drawn to cars that offered not only functionality, but also an appealing aesthetic. As the years progressed, the Renault 4 CV faced increasing competition from both domestic and international manufacturers. Other compact cars began to enter the market, offering better performance, improved design, and more modern features. As consumers' tastes evolved and preferences shifted, the 4 CV became less relevant eventually being overshadowed by a new generation of vehicles that better aligned with the demands of the time. Production of the Renault 4 c came to an end in 1961, marking the close of a chapter in Renault's history. Despite its initial success in post-war France, the car's limitations became evident over the years, and it was ultimately unable to maintain its place in a rapidly evolving automotive landscape. In hindsight, the Renault 4 CV serves as a reminder of the challenges faced by manufacturers trying to balance affordability with performance and design. 
While it played an important role in making cars accessible to a broader audience, the 4CV's shortcomings in power, handling, and aesthetics highlighted the importance of delivering a well-rounded vehicle that could meet the expectations of consumers. Renault learned valuable lessons from the 4CV's experience, which informed their future developments and helped the company adapt to the changing demands of the automotive market. The Simca 1010, manufactured between 1967 and 1981, holds a significant yet troubled place in automotive history. Developed by the French automaker Simca, it was intended to be a revolutionary compact car that could cater to the growing needs of European consumers seeking practical and efficient vehicles. The Simca 1010 was notable for its front-wheel drive configuration, which was innovative for its time, and it featured a transverse engine layout that maximized interior space, allowing for a roomy cabin and generous cargo capacity. However, despite its ambitious design, the vehicle ultimately struggled with severe reliability issues that marred its reputation and contributed to its decline in the competitive car market. Upon its introduction, the Simca 1010 was positioned as a family-oriented vehicle that provided a blend of functionality and affordability. Its design was functional, with a simple, boxy shape that was practical for urban driving. The car's spacious interior offered ample room for passengers and luggage, making it an attractive option for families. Furthermore, the availability of different trim levels allowed buyers to select a model that best fit their needs and budgets. These attributes contributed to the initial appeal of the Simca 1100, capturing the interest of consumers looking for a practical vehicle during a time when family cars were gaining popularity. However, as time went on, the shortcomings of the Simca 1100 became increasingly apparent. One of the most significant issues that plagued the vehicle was its vulnerability to rust. While rust problems were not uncommon in cars of that era, the Simca 1010 seemed particularly susceptible. This issue was exacerbated by the materials used in its construction, which lacked sufficient protective coatings to withstand the elements. Many owners reported that their vehicles showed signs of corrosion within just a few years of purchase, leading to concerns about the long-term durability of the car. The rust issue not only affected the vehicle's appearance, but also raised questions about its structural integrity, ultimately leading to a loss of confidence among consumers. In addition to rust concerns, the Simca 1100 was infamous for its frequent mechanical failures. Despite its innovative engineering, the vehicle suffered from various issues, particularly with its engine and transmission. Owners often encountered problems such as poor acceleration, engine misfires, and difficulty shifting gears. These mechanical failures led to a frustrating ownership experience for many, as they faced regular breakdowns and the necessity of costly repairs. In a marketplace where reliability was becoming increasingly paramount, these issues severely impacted the car's appeal and contributed to its declining sales. Moreover, the Simca 1010's reputation for unreliability had a ripple effect on the brand itself. As negative reviews and reports of mechanical problems circulated among consumers, potential buyers became wary of the model. This growing apprehension led to a significant decline in sales, as consumers turned to competitors that offered more reliable alternatives. Brands like Renault and Peugeot began to dominate the compact car segment, providing models that combined innovative design with superior mechanical performance. The Simca 1010's inability to compete effectively in this regard ultimately sealed its fate, leading to a decline in market share for Simca as a whole. The automotive landscape during the 1970s was also marked by economic challenges and shifting consumer preferences. As the oil crisis unfolded, consumers began to prioritize fuel efficiency and reliability in their vehicles. The Simca 1010, despite its affordability, struggled to meet these evolving expectations. As buyers increasingly sought out cars that offered both economical operation and dependable performance, the 1010's shortcomings became even more pronounced. Compounding these challenges was the fact that Simca was undergoing corporate changes during this period, with varying levels of investment in research and development. This instability hindered the company's ability to address the persistent issues with the 1100, further eroding consumer confidence. By the time production of the Simca 1010 came to an end in 1981, it was clear that the vehicle's initial promise had not been fulfilled. 
The car had become emblematic of the pitfalls that can arise when innovation is not paired with rigorous quality control and attention to long-term reliability. While the 1100 was undoubtedly a product of its time, showcasing advancements in design and engineering, its legacy was ultimately overshadowed by its persistent issues. In retrospect, the experience of the Simca 1100 offers valuable lessons for the automotive industry. It underscores the importance of balancing innovation with a commitment to quality. The NSU Prince, produced from 1957 to 1973, is a notable example of a compact car that, despite its initial promise, ultimately struggled to establish a lasting legacy in the automotive world. As a product of the German manufacturer NSU, the Prince was designed to cater to the post-war demand for affordable small vehicles. Its compact size and economical design were appealing during a time when many consumers sought practical transportation solutions. However, various mechanical issues, particularly with its cooling system, along with underwhelming performance and limited comfort, ultimately contributed to its failure in the marketplace. At its launch, the Shoe Prince offered a distinctive design that emphasized its compactness. Its small stature made it easy to maneuver in urban settings, and it quickly gained a reputation as a city car that could handle the challenges of congested roads. The Prince was marketed as an economical vehicle, which resonated with budget-conscious consumers looking for affordable options. Its price point made it an attractive choice for many, particularly in the economically strained post-war period, when buyers were keen on finding value in their purchases. Despite its initial appeal, the NSU Prince was plagued by significant mechanical problems that undermined its overall reliability. One of the most prominent issues was with its cooling system, which often failed to maintain optimal temperatures. This malfunctioning cooling system led to overheating, resulting in engine failures and breakdowns that frustrated owners. Given that reliability was becoming increasingly important to consumers, these persistent mechanical issues raised concerns about the long-term durability of the vehicle. While the Prince was marketed as a low-cost option, frequent repairs and maintenance costs quickly added up, diminishing its appeal to potential buyers. In addition to mechanical issues, the NSU Prince was often criticized for being underpowered. The car featured a modestly sized engine that struggled to deliver the performance expected by many drivers, especially those accustomed to more robust vehicles. Acceleration was sluggish, making it challenging to navigate busy roads and highways with confidence. This lack of power detracted from the driving experience, and as consumers became more discerning about performance, the Prince began to fall out of favor compared to competitors that offered more dynamic driving characteristics. Comfort was another area where the NSU Prince fell short. Although compact cars of the era often prioritized space efficiency over luxury, the Prince's interior design and features left much to be desired. With limited legroom and a basic interior layout, the car did not provide the comfort that many consumers sought in their daily drivers. As the automotive market evolved and other manufacturers introduced more comfortable and well-appointed compact cars, the Prince's lack of comfort became a more significant drawback. Despite its flaws, the NSU Prince maintained a dedicated following among some enthusiasts, particularly in Europe. Its small size and unique design made it a favorite for city driving and parking, and it was often embraced by those who valued its practicality over performance. However, as the automotive landscape continued to change, the Prince faced increasing competition from newer models that addressed many of its shortcomings. Other manufacturers began to produce compact cars with better reliability, more powerful engines, and enhanced comfort features, which ultimately overshadowed the NSU Prince. Production of the NSU Prince came to an end in 1973, marking the conclusion of its run as one of the more recognizable compact cars of its time. While it may not have achieved the widespread acclaim or lasting impact of other vehicles, the Prince remains a notable footnote in automotive history. Its legacy is a reminder of the challenges faced by manufacturers striving to balance affordability, performance, and reliability in an evolving market. In retrospect, the experience of the NSU Prince highlights important lessons for the automotive industry, particularly regarding the significance of addressing mechanical issues and understanding consumer expectations. While it aimed to provide an economical and compact solution, 
the Prince's shortcomings ultimately overshadowed its initial intentions. As automotive technology continued to advance, the lessons learned from the NSU Prince contributed to a broader understanding of the importance of reliability and performance in the design and manufacturing of compact cars, influencing future models that would succeed in capturing the attention of consumers.